everyone. Welcome back. This is Joni Stahl. It's good to be back. Hope everybody's doing good today and had a good weekend. I did. I'm well rested. So here I am again. Before I get started, as my practice always is, I would like to begin with prayer. Okay, Lord Jesus, we come before you. I come before you at this time. And I just want to look to you, Lord Jesus, in everything I think, say, and do. I consider nothing to be my own but yours. Even the very things, Lord God, that are being shared, that will be shared today. I look at the sources coming from you. I'm only a vessel. And I yield myself to you. For the express purpose of your Holy Spirit having free course, I ask you, Lord Jesus, to bless this message to all the people that are hearing and that your Holy Spirit would bear witness to the things that are yours and that long after this video is made, that you will carry this message in the hearts of the things that will be planted in them that are eternal. Bless every person that will hear this message to the praise of your glory and grace. I give you all the room to move and I step back and I thank you, Jesus. In your precious name, I give you thanksgiving and praise. Amen. Okay. So here I am. And I want to share a dream that I had with you. And I was not planning on sharing it with you, with anybody. Um, I shared it with my husband, of course. And of course, when you hear this, you're going to obviously know Jonathan's involved. And, you know, I get, I have dreams. And there's some that I will not share with others because I know those are just dreams God wants me to see for myself um, and not share with others. Because when you share things that are meant, not meant for other people, you may have noticed it will lose its power. Have you noticed that? If God gives you a word, you're not supposed to speak to other people. Do you notice the moment you share it with somebody that you're not supposed to? It's emptied of its power. I know that for myself. So I had this dream and it was the first, I think it was like the first week of, no, it was the second week of September. And I should have wrote it down, but I didn't because I didn't have plans on sharing it. And I know this might sound not like a good thing to do, but I'm not somebody who always writes all my prayers down, the dates and times, because whenever God gives me a dream, it's eternal. It's in there for good. And I never feel like I'm compelled to do that because, I mean, there's some that I absolutely do. And I have books of prayers that I, prayers, dreams that I've written down and dated because of the content and the nature of them. But it's never to say, well, I had it on this day to prove anything that I say, because I don't feel like if we are truly um, moving in the prophetic realm, again, we have to be obedient to what is shared and what should not be shared and to not have to prove ourselves to anybody, right? Because if you're really truly hearing from the Lord, what difference does it make, right? Although I will say that I did have this dream on all right. It was about the middle of the week on the second week of this September, this last September. And I'm just going to go with it. So here I go. And I'm going to let the Holy Spirit go with the flow in this because there's things I feel like I just really just want to flow and not. I mean, I don't even have notes today. Believe it or not, I have zero notes. But here I go. Okay. Here is the dream. So in my dream. I was with that man who was mostly always in my dreams. Not every one of them, but in most of them that the Lord gives to me. And in my dream, he was driving. And of course, I'm in the passenger seat. And we pull up to, and we're in this neighborhood. I don't rec really recognize it. And that really wasn't the point. Because in my dream, all I know is that we pulled up to some house, but we did not park in front of it. And we parked away from it. And so he, we get out of the car at the same time. I'm not knowing what's happening. So I'm following him. And we go up this driveway. 
to this really ugly house. I mean, and it was worse than ugly. It was so ugly that it was kind of spooky and dilapidated looking, but I'm going to, I'm not going to jump ahead. So here's how it looks. So we're going up the driveway and I look at where should be the lawn and it's just dirt. It's just dirt and rock sticking out of it and weeds sparsely placed here and there. And the weeds were so dead looking that they were like a pale whitish yellow. You know, when they're so dead, they're like twice dead. And I'm thinking, what, why are we here? What is this place? And all around, everything was just dead looking. And it was just a horrible, and I'm horrible house and horrible property. And I look at the property because they're kind of walking up slowly. And I'm thinking, look at this horrible house. And let me describe it to you. It was dark brown. It looked moldy, mildewy, warped because it was all woods, sided wood going like slats going all the way around it. Um, it did not have a pitched roof. It was a flat roof. It had a couple of windows in the front, but it looked like there was like rags covering the windows. And everything about this house was so ugly and depressing and hideous and sad and so the man i go to, the man knocks at the door but he opens it and he goes in and i go in behind him and no words are being said and i'm looking around like this and i'm like it was like there was no light in there but yet daylight was coming in but most of where i was looking was dark and there was like a dark gray hue you can feel the spirit in this house was even had a feeling of death to it and it was dark and i'm looking at the furniture and it looked like everything had been in there forever i mean the stuff was so old that it looked like it was just garbage now and the house was filthy and and everything looked broken and ugly and sad and sorrowful and i can feel that spirit of oppression and that there was even a death, like a spirit of death was in that house. And I was thinking, why are we even in this place? I just want out of it here. And so when we, so when I thought that, I turned and I saw the man leave the house. He just walked out. But I stayed behind just to really look again, like, because I'm trying to figure out why are we here. And I was looking in the kitchen at this point before I turned around and, leave, and left that the kitchen was just dark and it was the same as the living room. And it just, it looked like something and the feeling I got inside of it was full of sorrows, full of sorrows, full of darkness and sadness and deep grief. And I just wanted out of there. And so I left and I, as I left through the front door, I looked and I saw the man waiting by the car down the way. And I slowly walked down the driveway and I got to the end of the driveway. And then I turned around to look back at the house because I wanted to get one more look at it. And I was just looking at how horrible and sad and depressing. And so, I mean, it was completely a broken down house. I think I've made it clear. Okay. So then I walked to the man and I woke up. Well, I wondered about what that dream meant. I was like, Lord, what did that mean? Well, time marched on. I didn't say anything to John, my husband, Jonathan. And I just kept it to myself. And I was asking the Lord, what did it mean? And I kept it. It was so, because any dream you get from the Lord, it stays right up front. And it's, it's there. It's like, it's alive. Okay. Because I, I can tell the difference between dreams that are not from the Lord. They quickly fade away because things that are, are from heaven are eternal, but things that are of this earth are not, are temporal. So you'll notice when you have dreams or visions from the Lord, they are there forever. You see them as if you just had them. And so that, so that was like in the middle of the week. And then that Friday, Jonathan had the day off. Now we moved to this area recently. This is my hometown. John, Jonathan's not familiar with it. 
So I said to John, so, you know, we've only been in just this area. We live near the coast, very near the coast. Um, we can see it from our balcony and that's how close we are. So uh, Jonathan, though, he is not from this area, like I said. And so since we've moved here, we have never, I've never really taken him into certain neighborhoods around here. And I grew up here. And so that day he said, um, let's go for a drive. We like to do that. And so he said, hey, he goes, I have never even gone down over there. And I said, oh, I go, I mean, we live in a tiny little apartment, but over in this certain area, it's all million dollar homes. I mean, coastal, gorgeous, amazing, beautiful homes. Okay. And I said, oh, well, I said, I can take you down there. I said, um, I know the area really well. And I said, so let's take off. So we got in the car. And so I'm, I'm telling him, turn right, turn left. And I go, oh, turn down this street. Now, this is a particular street I really never, ever need to go down. And even when I was growing up here, there was really no reason for me to go down there. Like everybody knows about this street. But like I never knew anybody on that street. And there it was it's kind of out of the way. And there's no reason for me to go down that street. So anyways, I'm like, okay, go down this one street. So he turns down the one street and we're going. And all of a sudden I go, stop the car. So Jonathan stops the car and I'm like, cause he's sitting right here next to me and I'm going like this, like that. Cause I couldn't believe it. I go, Jonathan, he goes, what, what? Like he doesn't know why he's stopping. I go, Jonathan, I said, do you see that house right there? And he goes, yes. And I go, John, I call him John, but everybody wants, he wants to be called Jonathan. I said, I dreamed about that house just a few nights ago. And he goes, that house? I go, yes. I go, it's exactly everything how I saw it. Everything to the T is exactly how I saw it. Every single thing. And I'm telling you, you guys, it was every single detail I saw. Now, let me overemphasize to you. I have never seen that house before in my life. I don't ever, I mean, I, I remember going down that street, but that was like 25 years ago. Like I said, I mean, I grew up in this area, but there was never a, a need for me to be in that street. I know it exists, but I've never been down that street in probably the last 15 to 20 years, maybe that amount of time. And so I'm staring at it thinking, okay, now, because I've been asking the Lord, what did that house mean? Why? And now I'm seeing it in real life. Jonathan says, oh my gosh, he goes, look at the address. And the address was 2020. And we just sat there and there was this ominous feeling in the car. And I'm looking around thinking, I said, Jonathan, what does it mean? I said, look at this neighborhood. How is that house? And I'm talking, it was on the cliff overlooking the ocean. Every house on that street, you guys have to understand, it's a pristine neighborhood. I don't even think a house like that exists in this entire area we live in. It looked like something you'd see in gun smoke, like a shack, a dirty gun shack. Something that looks so ridiculous. Like, how is that house even there? And so I looked at that house and we're like, I'm seeing the thing, 2020, the address. And so we drove off. And since that day, I've been thinking about it so much. And I've been really thinking about it. Lord, tell me more. What does it mean? Why did you show me that house? I've never seen that house before in my life. And now here I am dreaming about it. And I'm seeing the date. Well, clearly the Lord began to, well, not clearly. It became clear to me as the Lord really made it quite obvious to me that this year coming that that house represented the coming year and you know i want to stop right here because i don't want to turn this video into this you know a lot of people are very sensitive like we don't want to hear doom and gloom i'm not a doom and gloomer i am a person whose head is always in heaven i see i have an eternal perspective down here is doom and gloom Okay, but if you're truly born again and you belong to Jesus Christ and you're in his word all the time and you truly know the risen Lord and you trust in him, then you can hear messages like that, like this. And, you know, 
God wants us to be people that are of a high caliber. That's what I fully believe. I'm not talking about a know-it-all. I'm not talking about a bunch of head knowledge because when push comes to shove, head knowledge saves nobody. It's your heart in Christ and the gospel and the Holy Spirit that is the one who makes disciples of men. Okay? So when the Lord showed this to me, I had to really think about it. Okay? And I really prayed about giving this message, okay? So I'm going to just keep going. So I, I fully believe in my heart, in my spirit, that the Lord was clearly showing me this coming year. We are aware of what's happening in the government. We're seeing today, like, you know, this whole impeachment thing. And I don't want to get into it. I'm not going to talk about Trump. I'm not going to answer any emails about Trump. This is not about Trump. This is about what is coming. What kind of message that God wants me to give to you so that we can be people who are ready for anything. Okay. See, I was even looking today that our troops are being pulled out of Syria, which means Turkey is going to invade them. And you think of those those beautiful Kurdish people, those Kurdish people are like, we're going to be destroyed. Now, there's so many political things happening that we have never seen before. I mean, listen, I'm no dumb dumb. I do my research. I do. I read all the same things you too. And many of you send me things and I'm looking and I'm reading. And it's very clear that 2020 is going to be a year of, there's going to be heavy sorrows. There's going to be some very heavy things economically, geopolitically, and it's going, I believe, on top of that, spiritually speaking. Okay, so the gardener all of a sudden is out there and he's going to start using the blower. Ah, so if you hear that in the background, please excuse me. Excuse him. So what I believe is that the Lord wants to show me, like, because it, it has to originate with me first. And I was really doing a lot of thinking about the year that we're living in and the year that's coming and how many, and who we are and the timing of our being alive here on this earth. And that our, it's not an accident. And we have to look at what's happening that's coming in the world because you see all these years that you've been reading your bible all the years i've been reading my bible let me put it to you this way and this is what i said to myself this is what i thought to myself when i was thinking about doing this message when i was thinking about that vision and how it came to pass about 2020 the things that are happening happening in the white house the things that are happening in this this total war in this our government things that are happening on the you know in israel in iran in you know the 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 church in iran that's exploding um people in afghanistan they're seeing the man in white which is jesus they're getting tons tons of people thousands of people are getting dreams of jesus christ himself and he is leading people to himself there are so many things happening and I can go down the list. Okay. But see, this is something I saw very clearly today. And, and I sensed it coming very strongly from the Lord because it came within. And if I can put words in it, I put words on it. I'm going to do it. I am not putting words in the mouth of the Holy spirit. I would never do that, but I'm going to do my best to say how I received it. Okay. So here it goes. I heard it like this. Joni, you've been reading your Bible all these years. Do you think it was just only for one reason? Sure, you read it when you were going through times of heavy trial, through heavy testing, through this, through that, right? Like going through a land, like a jungle and deserts and oasises and climbing mountains. There's all these different reasons. He was showing me and myself why, Joni, you have read the word, but you need to understand 
that when I had you read this word all your life, it was to prepare you for today to understand that what is coming next year, there are things that will be happening suddenly. And you're going to have to know, which is what you learn to do, is to act suddenly on my on the behalf of a situation with full strength of faith. Let me give you an example. On Friday, I was um, walked. I was doing some housework. I was in my kitchen. It was a beautiful day. My sliding glass door was open. We're upstairs. Um, I'm in my kitchen cleaning it and we live in a super quiet neighborhood. So it's pin drop quiet. You just hear birds and it's lovely. All of a sudden I hear a child screaming and I've heard children cry and scream. I'm a mother. Okay. And I heard a scream that was coming out of a child that was not a normal scream. And I turned like this. Now I looked down and a couple of doors down, I could see into someone's partially into someone's backyard. Clearly I could hear the baby. It must've been about two years old, whether he or she, I don't know. So I'm saying it. Okay. I don't mean to say it like that, but the child um, had to be around two years old because it was saying, mommy, mommy, I want my mommy. But there was more there was more than just a scream. Listen, I have babies. I've heard them holler, scream. And you know when they work themselves up, that's a scream we all know about. It's like, oh my gosh, you know when a child, you put them in daycare or something. And it's it's a terrible scream. Let me, uh, let me say this to you. It was a scream like it was being tortured. And, I, and it was a scream that I thought, uh, 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 uh. That's not normal. That's the enemy torturing a child. Like I can, and I'm going to say this and I'm take it or leave it. I felt like it was a spirit coming out of the child because I could hear the child's voice. And with that, something added to it that was not from a child. And I walked over to the screen and in a low voice, I said, in the name of Jesus, I said, Lord, I pray right now concerning that child. I said, I rebuke in Jesus' name that tormenting spirit. And I ask in Jesus' name and I command it to depart from that child. And now your peace be upon that baby. Do you know that woman was trying to get that child to calm down for several minutes, but it would let out a type of a scream. I mean, it would cry and then something of another voice would come out of it. And I go, mm -mm, that's a spirit. And I, and so I cast it out in the name of Jesus Christ. I took authority in the name of Jesus. Boom. That immediately the child went from that horrific scream, like as if a switch was flipped. I felt sorry for that woman. She was like, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. And nothing would help. And I knew it was being tormented by evil spirit. So as soon as I said that, it went from that to complete silence and a little bit of whimpering and then silence. And I went on to pray over that child. Now, Lord, let that child be in peace. Let your peace surround that child, the power and the name of Jesus Christ. And, you know, I want to bring that up to you because you see God is we have to be prepared for the suddenly. We have to be prepared for sudden things. And what Satan has been doing to everybody's life is getting everybody praying maintenance prayers. God, help us to get through this. Help us do that. I'm not saying not to do that. I pray those maintenance prayers myself. We have to, okay? So I, I know that God was showing me something. It was more than just a random, okay, do something. Is that he was showing me that this year that's coming, that he has people that he has been training for a long time. And everybody right now is exhausted. But something rose up inside of me today. When I woke up, 
I woke up like a man avouched for war. And I said, let me tell you something, Lord. I'm letting it roll today. Here it goes. I sat there and I said, let me tell you something, Lord. I have not come this far to crawl into the kingdom at the end. And all the words, like, because he had been showing me, like I said earlier, when I heard it in my spirit, you think you were just reading the word all this time just to get through this and get through that and get through this. Those are all those things that will live forever in my eternal life. They'll, they'll go before me in the annals of heavenly history. But no, don't you take it for granted. Let me tell you something. You are alive right now for a reason. This is not a pep talk. This is not me trying to get you churned up in the flesh. I don't do that because whatsoever is of the flesh is earthy. It's temporal and it does not originate with the Lord. I can tell the difference from the Holy Spirit and from what is the Lord. And I know this, that there has been many of us who have had rough lives, haven't you? You know who you are. I know who many of you are. Because it seems to me that the majority of God's fighters are people that have started out in terrible lives in homes and went through terrible lives. But God allowed you to do it and he allowed me to do it. So at the end, we can stand firm like a cedar of Lebanon. You know what? I felt so like the Holy Spirit was so, wow, I can't even put it into words. Like he was so moving in me today saying, I know who my people are. And they're going to stand up in everything that they have learned. Right now, they're tired. Right now, they're weary. But in a moment, I know who I can call and who will stand up. And you know, that has to be a personal thing between you and the Lord. Because let me tell you something. The enemy has been wreaking havoc with everybody, right? I have so moved far past the whole you know, trying to, you know, I don't debate with other Christians, but I see that now as something really way down the road because when I first started doing a minute to midnight and then I was doing, you know, doing this and doing all these emails and coming into contact with other supposed Christians, that was really a learning phase for me. That was a real learning phase for me to, you know, to learn. I'm not going to get into the details of what I learned and how it is obvious but what stands out to me now is the only thing that matters is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be full of this. You think, you know, I think to my, I was thinking this to myself and I said to the Lord, Lord, because I answered him back and I said, Lord, I said, I don't believe I read about Joshua in chapter 10 where he said, when he was be, being attacked by the Amalekites, when he went to war with them, he said, and he was fighting all day. And he finally said, son, stand thou still over um, Gibeon and thou moon over the valley of Ajalon. And then I thought to myself, and do you think that you just read where Samson picked up the jawbone of an ass and said, hip and, hip and thigh with slaughter? Have I slaughtered a thousand Philistines? Do you think we just read where he put his hands between two pillars and said, Lord, give me strength one last time. And he pushed with all his might and down came the temple. You know, I, and I'm thinking of all of these things that I read, including the feedings of the 5,000, including all these things, every single detail, because I have that kind of a mind and it was popping into my mind. I said to myself, Joni, do you think you just read that to go on and say, yeah, I've read that before. And I thought, if, if you are there and you're like, because a lot of Christians do this, they're like, I know, I know, I know Jonah was called by God to go to Nineveh. If you are, if that is your attitude, you need to go into the waiting room with Christ. You need to go into the gallery where the king is held because we need to be understanding that this word, this word I read like an attorney. Okay. This is something God put into my heart. Even when I was young, I would just stare at it and I would stop and I would look at things because you see, when I read this word, I read it as something that I can go into and say, Lord, 
did you not say, Lord, when, you know, this happened and that happened, depending on what situation I'm in, that's the same God. That's the same God that made that sun and moon stand still for a period of 24 hours. That's the same God that caused Haman to hang on his own gallows that he meant for the extermination for all the Jews and page by page and testimony and testimony. Every single thing is for today because see what I'm doing. And if I, you know, you're like, Joan, you're talking about yourself. Sometimes I am going to talk about myself as a demonstration to say, this is where I'm standing now with Christ. And for some reason, I feel the permission from the Lord. This is where I'm standing with Christ. I have not come this far to take everything that I have known in this word and remembered it, not just as a wow story, but to know my God and to know that that same God is who I have staked my eternal life on and that he has provided for me all my life and he's going to see us through to the other side. And I want to be part of what Christ is doing. And you want to be part of what Christ is doing. And if you are suffering this day, then you are partaking of the sufferings, which are of Jesus Christ. And if God is allowing you to suffer, look, suffering is suffering. There's never anywhere in the word that says, by the way, enjoy it. It just says, you know, like for instance, in Philippians 119, it says it, it has been granted unto us on the behalf of Jesus Christ, not only to believe upon him, but also to suffer for his sake. And yes, there's all kinds of suffering that may not seem like it's for the sake of Christ. And I'm not going to go through all that because I don't think every bit of suffering is on the behalf of Christ, I would think. But I want to be careful by saying that because there's other kinds of sufferings and that's a whole different show. But the point I'm making to you is this trust in God. Okay. Yes, you are seeing this. You're in the same world I am. And you're seeing the same news stories that I am. And if you're not a person who's watching the news, I get it. You're saying, but Joan, it's too depressing. That's fine. But you're going to still be in this same world that we're in. And it is important that at some level you understand what is happening around you. The tribe of Issachar had the understanding of the times that they lived in so that Israel might know what they ought to do and all Israel were attentive to them. You see, there has to be those of us and it should be you to some degree that you want to see what's happening because you see, this isn't 1900. This isn't 1950, 1970. We are close to the return of Jesus Christ. We're close to seeing an implosion in our government. We're looking at seeing a, probably a planned economic collapse. We're looking at a war that's going to erupt at any time in the Middle East. We are seeing things congealing. They are coming together and it's fast tracking. Okay. Now the people of the United States, they're so, see, we have enjoyed comfort. We've enjoyed Come on, I'm an American and so are you. I don't need to go into it, okay? And so even when we are shown things that are coming, the attitude of Americans is, yeah, I know that's pretty bad. Hey, you want to go grab a cocktail? You know, and, you know, and, you know, let's, let's go here, let's go there. But listen, I mean, think about this. When you look at the major um, governments, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire and the coming fourth wild beast as spoke about in Daniel, the beast, the beast system. You know, we we're pretty much there. OK, at the beast, we, you know, I think it's pretty much there in place. But what I'm saying is, is all those kingdoms, they were there hundreds of years longer than this nation. OK, and nations, according to good historians, last for the best years are 200 years. Okay. And after that, there's a decline and our nation, it may be a place where you have all kinds of freedom and we do, 
but there's something that is happening and God is warning us. God is speaking. People say God never speaks to me. Yes, he is speaking. God is speaking loud and clear to us every single day. And when you're in the Bible, you're in the word. Remember, you're, you're reading a word that is going to go into eternity. And it's not just about, uh, you know, parabolic lessons and, you know, and how we do things. And it's, it's a book that's, that t- teaches us how to live in Christ and trust in him. You know, I love that scripture in Jeremiah. I believe it's 924. It says, let not the rich man glory in his riches, neither let the mighty man glory in his might and let, let not the strong man glory in his strength, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that I am the Lord. No, no. He says, but let him that understandeth, let him that glorieth glory in this, that they understandeth and know with me. I want to stop right there. You see, a lot of people do not know Jesus Christ. They know about him. They do not thirst for him. They are not hungry for Christ. And to many that are hearing this, you're like, yes, Joan, we've heard it before. I'm going to repeat myself because a good teacher will repeat themselves. You know, when you're trying to talk to somebody and you know they're not hearing, think about how the Holy Spirit must feel, how he has been speaking for well over 2,000 years. You want to go take it further over 6,000 because there's over over 6,000 years in this book. So look how much he's been speaking. That's a lot. And his word is immune to destruction. It's going to be done. And his time, the time is coming. Look, a lot of people, they, you know, they want to get into rule into deep eschatology. And there's all these eschatology wars. Listen, let me say this to you. This is something I want to say. Put down your weapon against each other. Okay. If somebody does not agree with you, who cares? Who cares if they don't agree with you? If you're sure about what you believe in, what difference does it make? Fighting doesn't make anybody. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. I get it. I will defend the faith once in a while, but it's not up to me to make another person agree with me. We have to be people that are stalwart, that are strong in Jesus Christ, that know how to take an order that know how to hear him for ourselves, but you cannot do that unless you understand and know him. You see, I think of Bartimaeus. You know, there was two, actually, two blind men, and Jesus was on his way to leaving Jericho. And these men asked, what's going on? What's going on? And someone says, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Well, they spring right up. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon us. They're screaming out. And somebody nearby says to them to hold their peace. But when he knew he was leaving town, he he was thinking, I may never see him again or see him. I may never have this chance again. And he took it seriously. He didn't care if he looked like a fool. He didn't care that he screamed and was annoying everybody near him. You know what he knew? That that man, Jesus Christ, was passing by. And he screamed even the louder, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. And it said, Jesus stood perfectly still. And and Jesus said to somebody to go bring Bartimaeus to him. And a man came to him and he said, be of good cheer, arise, the master calleth for thee. You see, the Lord knows who's his, okay? Because when he says in his word, a tree is known by the fruit that it bears, right? If it's bearing corrupt fruit, he says, you're going to see it. If it's bearing a good, if a tree is bearing good fruit, you're going to see it. But let me tell you something. It says, The throne of God standeth sure upon this foundation, having this seal. The Lord God knoweth them that are his. 
And those that are his are going to rise up to the occasion. There is a rising remnant. I remember somebody, I, I did a video weeks ago and I titled it um, something like the rising army. And somebody wrote to me so offended just over that title. How dare you? That is total. That title is total heresy. How is that heresy? Heresy is you go into the NAR, you go into all these things, but I will never be afraid to say God is raising a mighty army all over the world. Look what's happening in the underground church in Iran. Look at what's happening. Did you know Iran, let me remind you again, is the number one fastest growing community of born again Christians. They don't have assets. They don't have any buildings. They don't own any property. They don't have any money. But look at the power that's going. You think any of them are arguing with each other, whether there's a pre, mid, or post rapture? You think any of them are beating each other over the head with Bibles and screaming at each other about who's right? You think anybody's over there thinking about all this crazy prosperity stuff? No way, man. They're operating in an axe style church, okay? Second largest growing is the Afghanistan church body. And the underground leaders are saying they're getting dreams of Jesus Christ. Listen, Jesus Christ is on the move and you want to be on the move with him. Listen, this, this government is falling apart in pieces. Okay. Whatever your take is, don't write to me, Democrat, Republican. I am autocratic. I'm a, I'm Theo, not autocratic. I'm the, yeah, autocratic. I'm part of, I'm a theocratic worshiper of Jesus Christ. Okay. And this is time now to stop looking horizontal. And when you're seeing things coming that look scary, the Lord says, I will make them to laugh at what? I'll make them to laugh at sudden destruction when it cometh. He said, when it comes. I want, I believe Jesus wants a caliber of Christians he can command. He wants to be able to command you without you asking questions. Without you running it by somebody, what do you think I should do? What do you think I should do? You see, God just cannot trust anybody with his stuff. It's true. Look at what people do. They take it upon themselves and then they make up, they, they, they ruin everything. Meaning they'll start their own ministries. They, they think they're hearing from the Lord. They take up prophetic mantles that are not their own. Next thing you know, they're going this way. They're going that way. And next, and, be, and the worst part of it, everybody's listening to them. Who can God command? Who are you listening to? I'm emphatic today for a reason. Because the Lord wants to get your attention. He doesn't want you or me or his people anymore. Don't worry about this world. Don't worry about what's happening at the White House. Don't worry about what Putin is doing. Don't worry because things have to play out according to prophecy that has gone before us. We're to war a good war. Remember Paul the Apostle told Timothy when he was installing him as the pastor of the church. He said, see thou, Timothy, that thou mightest war a good war after the prophecies that have gone before you. How about this? How about the angel that spoke to John when he was in his spirit in the book of Revelation chapter 20? He said, um, when John the revelator fell down to worship the angel, angel, he said, don't do it. He said, worship the Lord for the worship of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. And we have to be people that can operate under a prophetic mantle. Don't get me wrong. I want nothing to do with NAR. I want nothing to do with crazy prophecies out there that are a dime a dozen. 
but I know my master's voice and I know certain things he's been showing me. I have had some dreams of our president. I will not even share because it would turn everything upside down, but I know what I've been seeing. But listen, I love what Corey Ten Boom said. She had a dream one week before her and her family were rounded up by the Nazis. She had a dream that they would be rounded up by the Nazis. But she said later on in her life, after she was out of the concentration camp and well into her ministry, she said, if God is giving you a dream, if he gives you a dream of something terrible coming, it's, for, it's his way of telling you it's in his hands. So we have to be people he can command. People that won't ask, do you think, I'm not going to, see if, if the Lord, see I used to do that and it's part of the training, okay? When you're unsure of what you're hearing in the Lord and it's part of being human, that human part of yourself, you're going to run it by your friends. But notice when you do, it empties itself of power. I have noticed that when I have heard from the Lord and I think, oh, what, you know? I'll sit on it for a while. And sometimes he wants me to do something now. You know what I do? I do it now. And I let all the consequences go to him. You know what I believe? I believe that Satan is terrified of people that obey because he wants high obedience. He wants us to read the word and do exactly what it says, what he says. And he has to be able to trust you in a moment, in a moment's notice. I want to break from here for a second. You know, a lot of you know my background and I had a miserable background. Okay. And, but let me tell you something I, I know for sure that in that miserable life I led in it. I never, ever stopped reading my Bible, okay? And no, I'm not bragging, okay? I'm sharing. I'm teaching you something, okay? I stayed in. I was in the worst possible scenario a person can be in for 22 years. And yes, of course, I prayed and I was in my Bible daily to hang on for dear life. But while that was happening, the Lord was moving in my life in another way. He continued to use me even if I had sobbed for, th for three hours that morning. After three hours, the phone would ring. And next thing you know, I would be front and center in action, in obedience to and putting myself aside. And boom, I was obeying the Lord in a thing. And so I had learned through all these years in my life, even past that, um, that God, no matter how I was hanging on for dear life and reading the word, God was training me how to live in Christ in a pit of hell, okay? To be front and center when other people needed help. Was it hard? Yes. I wasn't like, oh yeah, what can I do for you? I was, I had a knot in my throat. I did it with my heart palpitating. I did it being overcome by fear. I did it <clears throat> knowing that <clears throat> that evening more hell would break loose in my life. I did it knowing that after I got done talking to that person or those people, that as soon as I hung up the phone or went home and opened my door, that I would fall down on my knees and sob and sob and sob. But God continued to use my life in it so that now, now I can obey God and I can do it knowing that though the enemy comes against me like a flood, the spirit of the Lord lifts up a standard within me and that's what he's going to do. There's people that have been writing to me saying, Joan, please pray for me. I want to leave my husband. He's been abusive to me for 30 years. Joni, please pray for me. My wife has left me after decades. Joni, please pray for me. Um, and, you know, and these are very sorrowful, terrible situations. And these are people that are powerful in the Lord. But let me tell you something. We're not immune. All of us are not immune to trials. We're not immune 
to getting a bad health report. We're not immune to any of it. But let me tell you something I know for sure. I know for sure, and I stake my eternal life on, is that I understand and know Christ. Let me finish that verse now. But let him that glorieth glory in him that glorieth glory in this, that he understand me and know me. That I am the Lord who executes loving kindness and righteousness and judgment in the earth. For in these do I delight in, saith the Lord. When you understand and know Jesus Christ, you don't have to be controlled by a religious system. You don't have to run something by anybody. I'm not talking to, sometimes you need good counsel, but something happens within you. Christ happens within you. And when you're filled up with the word and you're eating it and you're drinking it, he's alive and he'll speak to you. I'm going to re- visit something and then I'm going to go today. I want to repeat this story because it's worth repeating. Um, this was about four years ago. I was uh, sweeping my house and I was in my kitchen sweeping it and it was about 10 o'clock in the morning and I began to become hungry and I was thinking that after I was done sweeping that I would eat. And while I was sweeping and feeling being hungry in my body, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. And this is what I heard him say. He said, when you are hungry, your body tells you that you're hungry. And I heard that and I was like, you know, I'm thinking, yes. And he said, your body is alive. And it will tell you it needs food because it needs food to stay alive, right? And I was like, and I'm knowing. So I said, yes, Lord, of course. And he said, same it is with your spirit. He said, and he was talking about thirst. He said, when, you're, when your physical body, he said, is hungry or thirsty, he said, you're, it's because your body, your human body is alive and it's telling you to give it food and water to keep it alive because it's alive. Right. And I said, yes, Lord. And he said, it's the same, same. It is with your spirit being your spirit, man. He said, when you are spiritually alive, you're going, to, your spirit man is going to let you know that it needs food and water. The same exact way that your outer man tells you, it needs food and water, right? And I was like, yes. He said, and then all of a sudden, I saw an image of a dead person. And he said, you see that? Is that person hungry anymore and thirsty? And I was like, no, Lord, he's dead. He goes, exactly. Same it is with people that say they are born again, but never hunger or thirst for me. They are spiritually dead. They are not alive. If they never hunger and they never thirst for the word and for prayer and for me, he said, is because they're spiritually dead. I want you to let that sink in because there's people that say things like, well, I don't like reading the word because this and they come up with a thousand excuses. And I know that there's medical ones. I don't, I'm not talking to you that have medical conditions. But there's many of you out there that you just won't read the word. You just won't do it. I'm not chastising you. But you would rather watch hours of television. You would rather be on your cell phone for hours at a time. Um, you would rather be texting constantly. I mean, let's face it. That's what the, this church, this body has become. And that's why nobody hears from the Lord because he's not given his space because you know why? Where there is an absence of the Lord, then their unholy spirit comes in and that unholy spirit has an appetite. 
and that spirit of this world, it says, has lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And it will hunger. And you're good. And the more you feed it, the more you strengthen it. You know, there's people and I know there's people on Facebook. I personally hate Facebook. I'm only on it to post my videos, which I'm getting this close to shutting my Facebook uh, page down or to speak to my son who lives in Australia. And there are some very good friends I talk to. Other than that, it's a shutdown. I hate Facebook. I think it's also a government tool, you know, to collect information, which we do all know that. Um, but the point I'm making is, see, there's people that say, I don't, they, you know, they, they, they live on Facebook. They live on social media networks. You know why? Because they're empty on the inside. Because when you're full of the Holy Spirit, there's no room for this world. I'm not saying take on a vow of poverty and go into a nun's life. They've got it wrong. God wants you to develop your talent in the stream of life, but you develop your character. You know, you develop your character in the stream of life, but you develop your talent in private. Okay. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned, but it's this much. How much do you want Christ? See, the reason you're most likely not hearing from him, I know this is a blanket statement and I'm sure there's like 10 other things I can discuss about why you're not. It's because, let's face it, Jesus has been replaced. The Holy Spirit within you has been replaced. You give him time, but you give him the leftovers. Or you rush through a Bible reading. You rush through a prayer. He's not on your time. You know, the Holy Spirit is not going to just be ready because you're ready. It's the other way around. He, when he's ready, he expects you to be ready. Are you ready? Are you ready for Christ at a moment's notice? Even in the middle of your spouse leaving you? Even in the middle of torrents all around you? Because you see, God is allowing us right now to really turn to him. And let me tell you something, it's going to be hard to turn to him. If you're used to always being on Facebook and you're used to constantly talking and talking and talking and talking on the phone and texting and texting and texting, which is another way of talking, you're, you've given yourself over outwardly. You're living an outward life, but something will happen to you. It's going to take you a week. That if you really, really, I'm not talking about, you know, like we talk about fasting. Well, I'm going to fast from Facebook and I'm going to fast from my phone. That's not a fast. It's not a fast. It's a decision that you make to conduct yourself as a mature Christian. Where you can have your conversations and this and that. I'm not here as the text police. It's not my job. My job is not to do anything in your life. That's the job of the Holy Spirit to convict and to convince of sin or to train you. That's not my job. And it's yours. See, one day you need, you're going to stand before Jesus Christ. That's a reality. And you don't know that tomorrow is we don't, I don't know. I'm going to be alive tomorrow. I'm pretty sure I will be, but eternity is a long time and you don't want to exchange what God is giving you now for three more hours on your cell phone. Listen, you want to lay up things eternally. Where your heart is, there your treasure is going to be also. Where's your heart? You know, David, I was reading Psalm 119. David says, with my whole heart have I sought you. You know, he talks about with my whole heart, with my whole heart. He says it over and over and over again. But if there's parts of your heart that are not under control of the Holy Spirit, then you've got a foot somewhere and it doesn't need to be. And I say this to encourage you because you see, there's reasons why God is not moving in our lives. Okay. I get we need the internet. I get this and that. This is not the big lesson. This is not the big correction. I'm not here to correct you. That's not my job. 
but I'm your sister in Christ. And I'm trying to tell you back to that dream I had 2020. I don't have a good feeling about it. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't have any visions or dreams. Oh, this is supposed to happen. I don't know. But I know enough of this that I'm alive on this earth and I see what's coming. Like you see a tsunami, you see the waves go out and you're like, look at all the, look, wow, you can see the, for miles, you can see the bottom of the ocean like land. There's a reason why God's letting you see that. Because let me tell you something, not Trump, not the next person after him, if there will be another person after him, not Obama, not any president, no church leader, nobody on earth is going to save us. No one. We don't have any other savior. We only have one. And he's getting ready to establish his kingdom of righteousness soon. And he needs people. I'm not going to say he needs God is not in need of anybody. But I don't want to ever stand before him and say, I know, but I was totally involved in ministry and I was too busy. I am getting really busy. It's almost impossible for me to get to anything. But I make sure that if it gets to the point where it's taking too much of my time, I'm just not going to give it. I'm going to appear here. I'll do my best to be a part of your life in terms of being your sister and, you know, locking arm in arm with you. But I'm going to obey the Lord. I'm going to go with him. And you want to go with him too. So make sure that no matter where you are in your life, whether you're suffering or whether you're not suffering, don't look at anything as being here and yours forever. You know, I think about what it says in Psalm 73. You know, we talked about the rich men, the rich people. You know, I think in a way the rich people have it worse because they have to, their, their, their mind is always on their money and how much they own and who's really their friends or they're just being used for their money and everybody's under suspicion. And um, they think that, you know, and then see money really controls them. And I'm not saying every, because I've met a couple of really well-to-do Christians and they are not like that at all. Okay. Just, I want to be clear, but when you're, when you have a lot of property, man, it really owns you. You don't want to be owned by anything in this world. So let's be thankful to the Lord Jesus Christ for everything that he has given us. Um, and don't be afraid to tell the Lord what you need. Okay. Don't be afraid to let God know what you need because um, sometimes people will say, well, you're, you know, cause so many people want to come out with different things that you pray about. Like, well, I don't think it's right that we just pray and ask God for things for ourselves. You better be praying and asking God for things for yourself. If you are struggling and you are not knowing where your next paycheck is going to come from, if you don't know what's going to happen, you better be praying over the details of your family. Don't ever let anybody tell you. Well, we, if it doesn't involve the entire kingdom at large, don't listen to that because you are already part of a cog of machinery. Okay. So you better be praying over those you love. They are worth it. Even if they are horrible. Okay. You better be praying over your health. You better be praying over your house. You better be praying over every square inch of foot that you drive in a car when you go out there or your loved ones get in the car and go out there, you better be proud. I do. I pray for myself all the time. The priests of old did. It said when they went into the house of God, it said they offered up sacrifices first for themselves. Then they prayed for, you know, confessed their sin. They did all this. I don't do anything like, uh, you know, like a checkoff list. Now I do that. I come into thy house with praise. Then I do Thanksgiving. Look, so I flow with the spirit. Sometimes like this morning, I woke up, bam, I was on my feet spiritually running the race. There was things I had to stand in, things I wanted Christ to know. That's my secret prayer. Okay. Whatsoever things I pray in secret, God sees, he said it will reward openly. So you got to move with the spirit in prayer. So don't get caught up in reading prayers that people give you. Read this huge list of paper. Dear Lord Jesus, I stand against this and I pray this. Listen, God gave you a heart. What is in your heart? Are you afraid? Tell him. Are you terrified? Tell him. And don't let people say, well, you know, if you're worried, 
you know, you're calling God a liar. Sometimes if you're worried, you need to tell God you're worried. Tell him you're worried. I tell him if I'm worried, I'm like, Lord, I'm worried about this. God knows it's not because I don't trust him. I understand and know him and I glory in him. You know why? Because I have decades under my belt to get to know that the God that has delivered me out of every evil thing will deliver me again and see me into the other side, into the kingdom of heaven and in, up in, in, the, in the glories of heaven. So don't get caught up with reading other people's prayers. Sometimes it's good. It teaches you how to pray. Don't get stuck on that. God wants to hear from you. He wants to hear what you think about things. He wants to hear what's in your heart. You know why? A prayer is not a prayer unless it's in your heart, unless you're feeling it. Okay. Now I'm not saying again, because I know there's people out there because sometimes somebody will be like, well, I think that's wrong. It's like, you need to keep that with you and the Lord. But I know whom it is whom I have believed in and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And my prayer life is personal. It is intimate. And I know him. And I'm going to talk to him as Moses spoke to him face to face. And I fear him at the same time. I fear the living God. Because how it even says in Job, how little we know of him. So I do fear him. And so you pray what's in your heart. You pray. And you know... One of the things I've been praying for, for certain people that I know, is for God to begin to stir them up in their hearts. If you're not stirred up, that's why you're bored reading your Bible. That's why you're bored. Oh, I heard that verse already. It's like your heart's in the wrong place. Your heart is, 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 is darkened. There's darkness in there. You should be able to hear the word. It says, and say along with uh, King David, I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. Think about everything we know that they didn't know thousands of years ago and everybody's bored with it. What an indictment. Sorry to hear that. But I want to encourage you today. Stand upright. Put your shoulders back. Keep an eternal perspective. Keep looking up. Notice when you look up and say, Lord, I don't know about any of this destruction. I can't control what everybody's doing around me, but I understand and know you that you exercise loving kindness and righteousness and judgment in the earth in these things you delight in. And I glory in God, my savior, that I'm going to stand on the rock of ages and I'm going to trust in the living God. I'm not going to trust in what I see because what I see is not even going, it's, it's going to go away. <clears throat> but I trust in the eternal living God. You guys, I love Jesus. I don't know if you noticed, but I love him and I want every waking, breathing moment to reflect that. Think about Moses's face. Think about Stephen's face. It said Stephen's face. They marvel because it said their face, his face looked like that of an angel and Moses's face shone. And you know why? Because they reflect whatever they look at. You, you, you reflect whatever you look at. If there's deadness in you, it's because you're, you're, you're spending too much time in dead things. If you, you know what I'm saying? Like if you spend your time in the spiritual, then your spirit man's going to come alive and you're going to be hungry. Look, I'll tell you something. I'm not some big theologian. I'm not some big, big wig. And sometimes I might even get things wrong. But you know what? So did everybody in the Bible. But you get to understand and know the Lord. Because let me tell you something. A day is coming very soon. Where this nation's coming in for a rude awakening. And all the churches right now that are filled up every single Sunday. Hearing another story. About the feeding of the 5,000. Or walking on the water for the billionth time. They're just not ready. And they're going to have to be ready. In a moment of time. So God wants you to be ready. Be ready. And the only way you're going to do that. Is when you understand. And know him. Okay. All right you guys. That's all I've got to say. I'm going now. Go with the Lord. Have a good day. Shalom. And thank you so much. Uh, all you new subscribers. Welcome to the field notes. I like to tell everybody. This is more than just. A YouTube video. This is a classroom. Um. 
I thank you for all your emails. Um, keep them nice. I'd let everybody know in advance, everyone that's ab everything that's abusive, everything that's meant to start a wildfire. I don't even read, I read, I see just enough to see what it's about and I instantly delete it. I have no problem with that. You're totally welcome to disagree. Just be nice about it. Um, people, there's people that disagree and you're not nice about it. They go into the delete file. Um, thank you also for to all my new Patreon supporters and my old Patreon supporters. Thank you so much. Please pray about becoming a Patreon subscriber. Your help really does make a huge difference with this ministry because I want to keep doing these uh, shows. I just love it. And also, oh yeah, um, all my contact information and donation links are at um, are down below in the description box. So click on show more, just go down. And when you scroll down in the description box, you'll see my website address, Patreon, PayPal, you'll see all of that and my email. So that's where you can contact me. All right. All right, you guys, God bless you and have a great day. Okay. Shalom.